Good morning, y'all. Welcome to Highland Village Church of Christ. I'm here to give the announcements this morning. It's a special one for me because my little grandnephew was born October 1st. Hopefully he'll be out of the hospital today. We're asking for y'all's prayers for him. He's having a little trouble with his breathing, but God will take care of him and bring him through it. Then we have Joe Martin. She got her heart monitor this week and is waiting results. Brian Combs, a friend of the Butler's, is in critical condition in ICU with the COVID-19. John Reese is going to have some sinus surgery on Tuesday. And, of course, you all know about the wildfires and everything else going on in the world. We need prayer for that. And our teachers and schools are trying to get back onto some kind of routine, so we need to pray for them and knowledge. In our country, of course, our president, we need to pray for him as he battles the COVID and his wife also, and all the people up there that are affiliated with him in the, in the capital. All right, and the elders are going to be making decisions, hard decisions on 21, 2021, and then our neighbors, that we need to pray for them that they'll see the light and the love of Jesus like we do. And we just want to uh, bless the teachers and bless the elders that are having a meeting on the 11th so they can get everything right. All right, God bless y'all. Good morning, everyone, and happy October. Gee, who thought that we had we would make it this far? I love the change in weather. I hope you're enjoying it too. So, uh, and we'll just keep on keeping on. Before we begin our our singing, I'd like to uh, read some scriptures from the Bible, from the Old Testament, Song of Solomon, chapter eight, verses six and seven. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal over your arm, for love is as strong as death, its jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like a blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love, rivers cannot wash it away. If one were to give all the wealth of his house for love, it would be utterly scorned. And from Isaiah, Chapter 54, verse 10. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. And from the New Testament, John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, Jesus is speaking. A new commandment I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. All men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Let's sing that first song on our handout, We Will Glorify. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords who Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty, we will bow before his throne, we will worship him in righteousness, we worship him alone, he is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth, he is Lord of all. Hallelujah to the King of Kings. Hallelujah to the 
Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the blessings that we have, the, uh, this opportunity to worship you this morning. Father, as we sing these praises, help them to come from our hearts and not just from our lips. Help us to realize what it is at this opportunity to stand, uh, Father, in your very presence, to offer to you these spiritual acts of worship and to reaffirm and rely on and grow our relationship with you. Father, we wish to pray on behalf of those that we're concerned for, those that we're aware of, uh, who are struggling with things at this time. We pray for uh, James's great nephew, for we're grateful, Father, for this new life. And Father, we just pray that you would, you would um, bless this child greatly with the health struggle that has, that has gone on, that it will be uh, something is, is temporary and that, uh, that this child will continue to grow and, and become stronger and be able to uh, go home with, with its parents very soon. Father, for those who are going through treatments at this time, we pray for them, for the struggle that they're going through, the, the things that, they're, that their body is having to endure uh, during, this, during this time. We pray for excellent results for them, for the, the courses of action that have been um, outlined, and we pray that the results that they seek can be brought near to them. Father, for the others that are, that are sick, that have things coming up, and have gone through health trials, we just pray that, uh, that they can be blessed and that the relief that they have been seeking is, uh, we're grateful that, that they are seeing some of that, Father, and we pray for that to continue, that they are able to grow and, imp and increase in, in health and, and that their pain can be alleviated. We all struggle, Father, with things in our lives, and we, you know our hearts better than, than anyone. Help us to be honest with ourselves and with you for the, the things that we truly need, Father, in terms of our spiritual blessings. Help us, Father, to be uh, open um, to seek your guidance and counsel in your, in your scripture and comfort in, in, in time spent with you. We pray, Father, that you would bless us as a result of our opportunity to be together, the things that we have, that we are wanting from you, we, the blessings that we need. We pray that you would provide, continue to provide. Help us to see uh, your hand and your mercy in our lives and help us, Father, to be motivated by our relationship and love for you to reach out and help others who are struggling, who uh, need the things in, in, in life, in, in the afterlife that, that we are aware of. We just pray, Father, for uh, our nation. We pray for good decisions. We pray for um, people can uh, seek opportunities to work more to uh, move towards understanding and, and uh, to realize, Father, that, uh, that we all uh, need each other and that the, the things that, that we need and, and help us to be patient with one another, help us to endure and, and uh, go through trials when we need to, Father. We just pray that you would continue to provide for us the things that we need most, and that is your, your love and your forgiveness. Father, we pray that as we continue our time of worship together that we can feel the relief of having the weight of sin lifted from our lives, that we can realize and know, Father, that based on our relationship with with you through the death of your son that we can move through this time and through our lives with great peace father and, and great um, comfort knowing that we are in a right relationship with you be with us father and help us to always stay close to you and walk along the path of the scriptures through christ we pray amen Our next song is As the Deer Panteth for the Water, and after this we'll have our communion service. <clears throat> As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth to thee. You alone are my heart's desire.
this time we have the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper, to remember our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us on the cross, that we may have our sins taken away, that we don't have to carry the guilt and burden of those sins any longer. So if you'll pray with me before we take the uh, bread. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that that we have this opportunity the first day of the week as we have been commanded to remember you and the great sacrifice that was made on our behalf. Dear Lord, we, we know that, that uh, your life and, you, and the way you lived your life here on this earth as a man, you taught us how to live our lives and then you laid down your life so that we as sinful men might be forgiven. Dear Lord, thank you for this great sacrifice. And we know at this time, as we partake of this bread, that it represents your body that was given on our behalf, willingly by you and the Father, so that we can have our sins removed. Thank you, dear Lord, in Christ's name. Also, dear Lord, we want to remember as we continue in the service that there was blood that was sacrificed and this blood came from you, dear Lord, and it covered our sins. Something that was developed by the Father years before this world was ever conceived knowing that our sins would take us to the grave and we could not be saved without the blood of Jesus. Dear Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice. We thank you for the blood that covers our sins. Dear Lord, watch over us. Forgive us of our sins as we partake of this cup. In Christ's name we pray. Also, apart from the Lord's Supper, as we have completed that, we have the opportunity to give a portion of how we've been blessed back to the church to be served, to be used to serve this community, to, to serve our missionaries as the elders have seen fit to send our funds across the sea to help those that are lost. Dear Lord, we thank you for giving us the means to make a living. And we just thank you that each one of us in our hearts can give back a portion to be used in those ways. And you may give your uh, funds through a box in the back or you can do it online as well. Or call the church office and they'll direct you on how to, to give those funds. Let's sing our next song before Jason's lesson. God is love. Come, let us all unite to sing. God is love. Let heaven and earth their praises bring. God is love. Let every soul from sin awake, each in his heart sweet music make, and sing with us for Jesus' sake, for God is love, God is love, God Unite to sing that God is love. Oh, tell to earth remote. 
Christ we have redemption found. God is love. His blood has washed our sins away. His spirit turned our night to day. And now we can rejoice to say that God is love. God is love. God is love. Come, let us all unite to sing that God is love. How happy is our portion here. God is love. His promises our spirits cheer. God is love. He is our sun and shield by day, our help, our hope, our strength and stay. He will be with us all the Good morning. For those of you that missed us this morning, we missed you in Bible class. We had our first Bible class this morning at 930 since March the 15th, so we were excited to be back together uh, in Bible class this morning. For those of you who are here for that, I apologize. You get the next hour of me again. So, um, no, I'm just kidding. I hope I won't be up here an hour. But uh, we, uh, we had a, a, a great uh, Bible class this morning. For those of you who join us online as well, thank you for joining us in that. Do want to uh, remind of a couple additional announcements we have this morning. One of those is just a uh, Jethro sent us a big thank you this week. And many of you know he's a missionary we support in Zimbabwe. Uh, he completed his courses for his counseling degree and will be uh, graduating in November and will be a licensed counselor in Zimbabwe. And uh, the church here at Howland Village has helped pay uh, for that for him, for, put him through school. So we are very, very thankful for uh, his completion of that and his success in that. And so just uh, praise God for that. Uh, and also want to remind everybody, those of you who know we have adopted Highland Park Elementary School this year, as, or the last couple of years really, as our sort of local school we want to get involved in. Well, today at 3 o'clock, we are meeting in the annex. We've got a number of gift baskets, about 100 of them to put together to send over to the teachers tomorrow morning for their first day back of in-school classes and in-school learning. And so if you can help us today at 3 o'clock, we need your help just putting those together. Uh, or if you want to be a part of delivering those tomorrow morning, we are going to meet here about 9 o'clock and take those over between 9.30 and 10 o'clock tomorrow morning to the school. So uh, just opportunities for us to serve and continue in service that way. So if you want to join us for that, we sure would appreciate it. So as we begin this morning, um, the Sermon on the Mount, as we began a couple of weeks ago, is a challenging passage. It is a passage that uh, not only was challenging for those that heard it at the time, but it's challenging for us today, even as we sit in pews some 2,000 years later, listening to the words of Jesus again, talk and teach in this sermon. It is challenging for us. You know, there are times when you come across uh, passages of Scripture that sometimes you go, I think I don't want to preach on this. <laughs> this is one of those times you kind of struggle through it and you realize, no, this is important because Jesus had mentioned it and talked about it and we should too. And so this morning, um, we're going to talk about a very sensitive topic. Uh, these two issues are tragic in our society today, and that is lust and divorce. But tragically, they're a part of our everyday life. 
Tragically, they're a part of everything that is in the world around us many times. They're so common that we choose to accept it many times as normal practice in the world around us. And both of these are tragic that it's become that sort of thing. The Sermon on the Mount calls us to Christ-like characteristics. It calls us into being the Beatitudes to be holy, to be different than the culture around us. And many of us know too well the hurt these topics cause. I am all too familiar with most of these, as many of you are as well. Lust and divorce affect most of us at one point or another, whether us personally or someone we know. This morning, we're going to address these passages of lust and divorce through the lens of Christ as he is teaching here in the Sermon on the Mount, but also at other times during his earthly ministry as he walked. We're going to address them as the Bible does, but they are sensitive topics, and so just be prepared for that this morning. We begin this morning with the same phraseology as the passage we talked about last week that is uh, kind of going through these next sort of six things talked about here in the Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5. It talks about here the, the two statements. You have heard that it was said, but I say to you. Jesus is again contrasting the way that the Pharisees taught on this particular topic versus what was actually the intent of the law, not just what the Pharisees were teaching on the law. It focuses our heart once again on what is the heart of the law, not just strict obedience to what the law says. So let's begin this morning with Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 28. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. There's a great song we used to sing with our kids, and I sang it at VBS, and it was, Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. That's the point of Matthew 5, 27 and 28, right? Very simply, I could just stop there and we could all go home, but I won't. Um, And so um, this section begins with a direct quotation from the Ten Commandments. In fact, it's a direct quotation from the Seventh Commandment out of Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. You must not or you shall not commit adultery. Jesus, once again, as we've talked about previously last week, is supporting the law. He is saying, once again, here's the law, and yes, this is what the law says, and yes, I... Agree with it. You must not commit adultery. The interesting thing about this one is is that it continues on, right? So you have the old law and the old teaching of that you must not commit adultery. Yet now as we come to the New Testament and the New Covenant, it doesn't change. Adultery is sinful both in the law and in Christ. This is one of these things that carry over. The penalty for adultery remains the same. In the old law, the penalty for adultery was death. In the new law, or in the new testament, we are in Christ. The penalty for adultery is spiritual death, right? It's still very much similar to the original meaning behind the law. The Pharisees' teaching on lust, however, had really sort of messed up and perverted this idea of what the law actually said. Because they would teach that the physical act of adultery was wrong. But if a man wanted to lust... That was okay, because that was just the way of man. You might say they basically use the same excuse that many times our culture uses when it comes to this issue of lust, saying, oh, it's just boys being boys. That's kind of what the Pharisees would say when it came to this idea and this teaching on lust. What's interesting is as they taught that, they completely threw out the 10th commandment, you shall not covet. They would not take the seventh commandment and marry it with the tenth commandment because the tenth commandment says you shall not covet, but especially you shall not covet another man's wife, right? If you want to complete that statement out. But the Pharisees would take that and sort of ignore it and throw it out and go, that's not what the teaching on lust is about and adultery. See, the Pharisees, you might say, had a very narrow definition, very narrow definition of sexual sin, but a very broad definition of what is sexual purity. Jesus knows this as he is talking there at the Sermon on the Mount, knows the teachings that they have been given to the people, and he kind of turns it on its head. Because Jesus takes this idea of adultery out of just the physical act, right, and says, no, it's so much more than that. It is found in the heart, 
through what the eyes see. You might say that Jesus has the exact opposite view on sexual sin that the Pharisees did. You might say that Jesus had a very broad view of what sexual sin was and a very narrow view on what sexual purity is. Jesus sees sexual purity, right, as the narrow way of a husband and a wife only. That's the only way he sees sexual purity. That in this context between a husband and a wife, sex is a gift from God when it's used in marriage. But outside of that, he sees it as sexual sin. The Greek word here is very interesting. It is the word blepo. I just like saying that word. It's a fun word. You should say it. Blepo. Anyways. But it, what it actually means to lust, it tells us that the word blepo is this idea of looking longingly, an intentional stare, a fantasizing stare as you look at something or someone. It is, blepo is mentally engaging with the eyes in adultery long before the physical act ever occurs. The best example we have of this word blepo is found in 2 Samuel 11, 2 and 4, the story of David and Bathsheba. It says, it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and, and one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanliness, and then she returned to her house. David saw with his eyes as he sat on his rooftop a beautiful woman below him. But he didn't just see a beautiful woman. He lusted after her. He blepoed <laughs> after her, right? He longingly looked. He fantasized about her. And this lustful gaze led to something so much more, right? It leads to adultery. It led to lying. And ultimately, as we know in the story of David and Bathsheba, it leads to murder. Last week's lesson, anger and murder. We are warned throughout the Old Testament about the lustful eye. You see it in the Psalms, in the Proverbs, in Job, in Hosea, etc., etc. This idea of what a lustful intent and lustful eye is. And what's funny is there should have been no doubt in the Pharisees' mind what actually the teaching on lust was. And yet still, they completely perverted that teaching to let it say, eh, it's just boys being boys. Jesus follows this teaching on adultery unless he follows it up with kind of tells him, how do you deal with this? How do you deal with the fact that, the, that of this lustful eye? And look at Matthew, because we continue on in Matthew now 5, 29 and 30. So if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. Some have taken this passage a little too far. Um, we call that group of people ascetics in the church history world. They are ascetic people. They literally mutilate their body in order to prevent sin. Is that what Christ is talking about here? Is he telling us to go and mutilate our body to literally pluck out our eye and cut off our hands? No, as Jesus is teaching here, he's using hyperbole. He's using exaggeration to teach us in the second half of this passage. He's teaching us, though, the very simple concept. You must cut sin off at its source immediately. You must cut it off from its source, whether that be your hand or your eye or your foot, he goes on to say later on in the book of Matthew. Why is this such a big deal? Because it's this idea of the marrying of the heart and the mind. The heart is the source of, of, of everything. We must do everything we can to protect our hearts and minds from sin. Because what does sin lead to? death or as the passage here says the fires of hell right this is be something that we do everything we can to prevent sin because we don't want to spend eternity in the fires of hell and so what happens if our eyes are causing us to sin do we pop them out no but we avert our eyes we act as if our eyes are popped out that we no longer have eyes we don't look at that we don't touch that we don't go to that place because we want to not sin at all costs we need radical surgery on our hearts and minds when things like lust and adultery and stuff take over in our hearts. As Christians, we desire Christ and being Christ-like so much more than, um, than we desire the lusts of this world. 
We desire a committed relationship in Christ Jesus our Lord more than we des the desires of the flesh. We want Jesus and we understand how beautiful and wonderful he is so much more than this world. This relationship with Christ is beautiful in the eyes of God. In fact, you might say that God sees the beautiful committed marriage relationship between a husband and a wife as a metaphor for the relationship with Jesus, right? God tells us that in numerous places. That's why in this next section, Jesus goes on to teach on the dangers of divorce. He kind of marries these two sections together. It's a very simple two-verse little thing here in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 31 and 32. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual morality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. This section is Jesus' teaching on the intent of the law once again. But you have the Pharisees who have completely perverted that teaching once again as well. In fact, this section here in Matthew is taken directly from Deuteronomy 24. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't finish that. Let me finish. Uh, whoa, there we go. I skipped it. There we go. Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4. It says, when a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house and she departs out of his house, and if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter man dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord. And you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. You can see the similarities between Matthew 5 and here in Deuteronomy 24. This idea of the certificate of divorce and what happens. Why is the issue of divorce even needing to be brought up here in this passage or even in, um, uh, by Moses in the Old Testament? The answer is because divorce was already taking place. It was a part of the culture around them, and they needed to really define how to deal with it among the Israelites and even among us today. Divorce, as you see here, though, is something interesting, right? Could a woman divorce a man? No. A man could divorce a woman in the first century or even in the Old Testament, but a man could not, I mean, a woman could not divorce a man. There is one addendum that happened in the first century that where a woman in very extreme circumstances could find a way to convince the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, to allow her divorce, but it was not common. It was very, very difficult. So the teaching seems pretty cut and dry, except that once again, the Pharisees took divorce way away from the intent of its original meaning. The Pharisees used the word in Deuteronomy of indecency, you see here, um, verse 2, I believe. Yeah, in verse uh, 24, verse 1, it says, If you find no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her. Well, the Pharisees took that word indecency and expounded it exponentially for the culture around them. So they would look at that and say, You can divorce your wife if you think that her cooking is indecent. If you think that her cleaning is indecent, if you find anything indecent you don't think about her that you think is indecent, you can give her a certificate of divorce. In fact, that term certificate of divorce really means just to be gotten rid of or an instrument of dismission. That's what it means really in Greek. It is just an instrument of dismission. You can dismiss them for whatever reason that you think they are indecent. Jesus' teaching on divorce is completely different. See, Jesus, as he teaches here, is kind of telling them it should not be something so lightly done, so just sort of flippant that just happens all of the time. Divorce is the last option after all attempts at reconciliation have come about. It is only then it is allowed, and that's not because God likes it, it's because God allows it, because he understands the hearts of man and the hardness of man that happens because of adultery and that can be so difficult to overcome. Does that mean God condones divorce? No, not at all. But you do see examples of teaching on divorce further discussed and really kind of in more detail by Jesus over in Matthew 19. So I want to flip over there for a moment. Matthew 19, 3 through 9. It says, The Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? You see that question? Right there, you get the question of what the Pharisees were doing. They were, they were trying to tra uh, uh, trap Jesus about saying, hey, you know, we, we divorce for any cause at all. 
Jesus answers them, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. They are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said then, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to, to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. The Pharisees are trying to defend their teaching and their idea and their intent, uh, their, really, uh, their, um, their teaching on the law and how they see the law. And yet as Jesus kind of comes and, and preaches on this passage, it's interesting that when they ask him about the issue of divorce, what does he go to? Does he talk about divorce? No, it's interesting. He goes straight to marriage and says, let me tell you the beauty of of marriage. The reason uh, that we have put together this idea of this thing called marriage is between a man and a woman that marriage when lived out co correctly is an example to the world of the love and compassion and grace and forgiveness and purity and peacefulness of life in Christ. He really, really sort of builds up this idea of marriage when he talks about right the two shall become one and this is how God intended it to be. He doesn't go and talk about divorce. He says, no, let me tell you about the beauty of marriage because that's really the focus. How the church and Jesus are joined together in a pure relationship of marriage. However, lust and adultery can cause that marriage bed to be defiled. It can cause that marriage bed and the teachings of Jesus to be perverted. And here is where God allows for divorce, but only because the hardness of man's heart to forgive and reconcile such betrayal of the marriage. Does God like it? No. God wants there to be forgiveness and reconciliation in all aspects of marriage. Is it even possible to reconcile a marriage following the betrayal of adultery? It's hard. I've seen couples do it. But it is hard. It is a long road. It is a lot of prayer. It is a lot of forgiveness. It is a very tough road to go down. But sometimes, right, so is our sin against God. It is a very tough road. And yet God still says, I forgive you and I want to reconcile with you. That's the teaching. God allows divorce because he understands the hardness of man's heart. He understands the difficulty that adultery causes. But he doesn't like it. Because in every divorce, there is hurt, there is pain, there is sorrow. Divorce is a painful, excruciating experience for every single couple that go through it. And God doesn't want us to suffer. He doesn't desire for us to go through these, these difficult moments. He never intended it for that to be the way. He intended for marriage to be this beautiful thing between a man and a woman that is that is, that is wonderful for God, that is an example to the rest of the world of this relationship between Christ and his church, right? That was the point and the beauty of marriage. And yet, sometimes, it gets broken up. This teaching that divorce was permitted, but not required, by the way, is once again Jesus being completely countercultural to his day. The law required divorce for adultery because the woman was now unclean. So if the woman has gone and committed adultery, she is now unclean, and the man must not reconcile with her, must not forgive her, but must divorce her because she's unclean. And that was the law. And Jesus says, no, you can reconcile in this manner. You can forgive in this manner. I will permit divorce, but I am not requiring divorce. Jesus wants us to reconcile all of our relationships and to be redeemed and forgiven from our sin. He wants us to reconcile all those relationships with people because that's what he does for us. Remember the book of Hosea? We have this great moment in Hosea chapter 2. Israel is seen as, as the adulterous woman. And then God comes in and calls, them, calls Israel back into repentance and forgiveness and reconciles them. And the beauty of Hosea is what does he call them again? It says that God calls them his wife. He reconciles with them and brings them back into the beauty of redemption and forgiveness. Jesus longs for every, every, every follower to be in a healthy relationship with him. The teachings of Jesus about adultery and lust and divorce here speak to Jesus' teaching on relationships. The relationships in the first century were very one-sided. 
It was a male-dominated society where they made the rules, and this was terrible for women of the first century. If you were a single woman in the first century, you were almost doomed to die. But there was no one to take care of you. You could not get along in life, and you were probably given a death sentence. If you had been previously married as a woman and divorced, it was almost impossible to find a husband, and therefore now you found yourself alone, single, and in real danger. The interesting thing I saw this week as I was studying this that really came to light as I studied this more and more and really dug into this is that this teaching, and I've heard a lot of sermons on this issue of lust and divorce in my lifetime, and I've never seen it this way, and that is this is really a teaching about the compassion, care, and consideration that Jesus has and concern he has for women of the first century. This is really Jesus taking care of the women around him. He did not want women to be treated harshly. There is a sense here at the end of this section that Jesus is trying to literally protect the women. When he states that remarriage is an act of adultery, except for marital unfaithfulness, Jesus is trying to prevent the man from just tossing out his wife and destroying her character. I love how one commentary put it this, uh, as I was reading it. It said that Jesus is trying to protect the woman from becoming some kind of marital football tossed back and forth by irresponsible men. Isn't that really kind of showing the grace and care and love that Christ has? He's encouraging the husband in this passage of scripture to stay committed, to reconcile, as we might say in our vows as we get married, to love, honor, and cherish his wife. To keep the covenant he has made with his wife at all costs, to not destroy her character, to not demean her, to not just toss her out and, and, and put her in danger, but to love her, to treat her with respect and dignity. Think about the teaching on lust for a minute. Jesus here is warning the men to be careful to not see women as sex objects, to not just uh, uh, degrade them and see them in that way, but to cherish their beauty, to protect their dignity, to keep pure the relationship between the man and the woman. It is really this idea of, of protecting the women around him. He's calling out the male-dominated society of the first century. He is being countercultural to the people around him by telling them, telling the men to cherish, to love, protect the ladies in their midst. He's calling all of us into a purity of heart even today, that we are to be a pure of heart, that we be, must be careful what our eyes see. We must be careful how we handle our marriage relationships because marriage is this great example, the shining light into the world. God created marriage for us to be an example to the world around us of this, of this relationship that is so pure and so wonderful and so holy. I, I ran across this quote. It says, Christ is not merely a means for a better relationship with your spouse, but your spouse is a means for a better relationship with Christ. Right? We grow together as a married couple, as a husband and wife, to show the world about the love of Jesus, about the forgiveness that happens within a marriage, about the reconciliation that happens within a marriage, about the grace given that happens within a marriage, about the words, I'm sorry and I love you. Jesus is calling us to have the characteristics of the Beatitudes in our relationships with each other, but most importantly, right, in that marriage relationship. That our marriages are an example of the beauty of Jesus' relationship with us. He never gives, up on, never gives up on us, and he constantly calls us into relationship with him. That is really the call of the, of the Sermon on the Mount, of these teachings on lust and divorce. That is really the call for us today, that we want to see the beauty of Christ shown in our Christian marriages, in our Christian relationships, that the world around us sees something different by what and how we act in our marriage and in our relationships and how we treat those of the opposite sex. That is very important to God. This morning, you may find yourself with some struggles in that. We'd like to pray with you. Maybe this morning you find yourself wanting that beauty of that relationship with Jesus. You find yourself really desiring to have something different, that your life is kind of a mess, and you're like, you know what? I desire that relationship with Christ, to have that beauty, that reconciliation, that forgiveness. You can get that through the waters of baptism. If you need to be baptized, you need the prayers of this church. Once you come now, we stand and we sing. Let's sing our next song, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. I know that my Redeemer lives and ever prays for me. I know eternal life he gives from sin and sorrow.
sing the last song of Hand Out Into My Heart. Into my heart. Father in heaven, what a blessing it's been to gather together to sing songs of praise to you, Father, to worship you, to remember your son that sacrificed himself for our sins. We're so thankful for the time you've given us this morning. Uh, We pray that you will be with us now as we depart from this place. Help us to go out um, and as we come into contact with people this week, Father, help us to uh, let you shine through us, to let your love touch them. Father, I pray that you'll be with those that are on our sick list. Uh, we pray that you will continue to be with those who are dealing with the COVID illness. Uh, Father, we know there's a lot of them. Uh, we pray that you'll be with those that are attending, attending to them, that you will continue to bless them and give them the strength uh, to administer to them. Father, we're thankful for everything you've given us. We pray that you'll guide, guard, and direct us always. In Christ's most holy name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> 